And the only way you can stop that is by not eating carbs. And then your muscles are full of fat and very little carbohydrate, and then you will burn fat. And something which I didn't really catch on to until two years ago, we studied an athlete who was a, as a low carb athlete, but it was a really good athlete. And so that he could cycle at a very high rate from the moment he cycled. And we had him do a 100K time trial. And from the instant he got on the bike, he was burning 1.7 grams of fat per minute, which normally, if as you know, if you're carbohydrate adapted, you would never get anywhere near that. But if you're not, if you're carb adapted, you start at 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and it takes you hours, hours and hours and hours to get anywhere near. But the moment he got, he was burning 1.7. Well, we, we subsequently did studies to prove it, that the content of muscle glycogen depend, determines how much fat and carbohydrate you burn. So now the final little story. So I went back to those original studies, the 1967 studies, and I looked at the group who were on the low-carb diet. And although, although they could only exercise for about an hour, they had a rate of fat oxidation, which was higher than anything that had ever been reported. But they didn't notice it hmm. because they were focusing on the carbs. Yeah, and so from the word go, they were burning a whole lot of fat. Now, they were not fat adapted, which oh, is the true. other interesting point. These people were, were athletes or, or probably just general people. Well-trained. I, I think they were policemen or something. I can't recall what they were. Mm -hmm. But they were, they were burning fat even without being fat adapted. And so, so how, what do I interpret that to mean? That I interpret it to mean that the body is designed to burn fat. And it, the only way you don't burn fat is if you're eating a high-carb diet. So the natural state is to burn fat. You don't need to train for it. It develops. And Louise Burke has shown that. She took some Olympic athletes who were high-carb athletes. Within five days, they were burning 1.6, 1.7 grams per minute. They didn't need to go out and train. Okay, because glucose is obligatory for the brain. And, and that's why I think that the glucose oxidation goes up during, blood glucose oxidation goes up during exercise. That shows it's obligatory. You can do what you like. You can't stop it. You can take all the carbs you like. You won't stop this. It's going to go. And you can start exercise carbohydrate depleted. And the rate of blood glucose oxidation is the same. So it's, it's fulfilling some obligatory role. And obviously part of its brain, some of it may be kidneys, some of it may be other tissues. And it may also be obligatory for muscle. That, that's, I'm not going to exclude that. Mm. But it's such a tiny amount that uh, it's not as we used to think that it's the predominant source. It's a tiny, tiny amount. And I'm not excluding the possibility that you need a little bit of carbohydrate to keep muscles working properly. So one of the other studies I looked at in detail was the first study to show that carbohydrates ingested during exercise could improve performance. And it was a study written by Ed Coyle in 1986. He starved the people for 12 hours before exercise. That was the key. But I went back and worked out the metabolic state of those athletes as well. And I noticed that they didn't report the actual fat oxidation rates. They, they reported the carbohydrate oxidation rates. When I made the calculations, I showed that these people were the ones, when they took carbohydrates, they were burning fat at 1.2 grams per minute, which was the highest value ever reported at that time. And no one noticed it. Hmm. So who were these athletes in 1986 who were burning so much fat? The answer was they were Olympic class elite cyclists in Austin, Texas. Ed Coyle got some of the best cyclists and they were fat adapted in 1986. Hmm. Why? because that was before the carbohydrate craze hit.